Um, from previous slide, you already know the relationship between the thermal conductivity and electrical conductivity with the direct coefficient. And you also know every material has its own direct and coupling coefficient, right? And we need to back to our topic. Um, the purpose actually in these lectures is going to uh, try to tell you how to quantitatively calculate the entropy production rate per volume. And from previous slide, actually you get, you know that there's a beautiful equation here, right? In order to get the entropy production rate per volume, you need to know the absolute temperature and also the, the flux times the driving force. You need to sum up all the flux and the driving forces together. So I'm going to give you two examples and probably in your slides you hang out. Uh, I remember uh, we use the CAS1 and CAS2 but I do some I did some modification here in order to describe the questions in details. So the first question Q3 or the or CAS1 show in your uh, handout is if we have a temperature gradient or we observe temperature gradient on a heat conductive material and this gradient actually is in steady state so can you uh, estimate or calculate the entropy production rate so first of all in order to get the entropy production rate in this case you need to identify how many driving force be applied on this distance or in uh, on this conductive material. I will say one, right? Because we only observe or let's own uh, driving force, which is a temperature gradient, be applied on uh, this uh, con heat conductive material. So based on this, and by using this equation, we can get absolute temperature times the entropy production rate equals to the flux. It will be the heat flux because the uh, driving force is temperature gradient. And the driving force here will be the minus temperature gradient divided by T. So based on this, as long as I know the we know the temperature gradient, right? So as long as I know the heat flux, and also we know the uh, absolute temperature, then you can easily get the entropy production rate per volume. So how to get the heat flux? Based on Fourier's law, we know heat flux equals to minus thermal conductivity times the temperature gradient. So we just uh, substitute this heat flux with this term. So we times the driving force turn, then we will get the thermal conductivity times the uh, temperature gradient squared divided by T. And because thermal conductivity is positive, this term is positive also. And also the temperature, absolute temperature is positive. So we believe the entropy production rate per volume is larger or equals to zero. And based on this, we know in, in order to get the entropy production rate per volume in the system, we need to measure the absolute temperature of these materials and know the thermal conductivity of this material and also know the temperature gradient. Then we can easily get the entropy production rate per volume. But some students ask me about, oh, let's a temperature gradient be applied on less materials. So how to What's the T here? I will suggest you to use the average temperature of this material to, uh, to identical that T average here. So we can get the entropy production per volume. Okay, so let's move to the question four, which probably is a case two show in your handout. And in this case, we uh, there's a concentration difference observed on these materials, which means that uh, there's a mass diffusion happens on these materials. So can you uh, can you identify or can you uh, uh, determine the entropy production rate per volume? So the same idea uh, with a previous question. How many driving force be applied on this system? 
we only observe the concentration difference, right? So which means uh, only uh, one driving force be applied on the system. But as you know, concentration difference is not the exactly driving force to drive this uh, mass diffusion phenomenon. The act, uh, the the exactly your actual actual driving force here would be the chemi minus chemical potential gradient. So based on the equation here, we can simply write down this equation and only one driving force here. So this will be the atomic flux times the minus chemical potential gradient. And as we know, atomic flux based on the fixed first law, we can express as the minus mobility of diffusing agents, the concentration of diffusing agents, and times the chemical potential gradient, and it will be the minus one. Okay, so here, uh, then we times the driving force. So the results we'll show here will be the mobility times the concentration times the chemical potential gradient square. So this term must positive, positive, positive. So this term must larger or equals to zero. So based on this, you, as long as you know the absolute temperature or average temperature here and mobility and concentration of this diffusing agents and also a chemical potential gradient, and then you can simply, you can easily um, calculate the entropy production rate prevalent. So some people, some students also ask me about how to identify the concentration of this diffusing agent. You can use EPMA or SIMS to get the profile, concentration profile of this, uh, your interesting diffusing agents. Then you can take the average on this, this one. So uh, you also can get the CI to, you just uh, use that uh, value to substitute CI. And regarding to the mobility, don't forget the definition for mobility is when you apply the unit driving force, the velocity of this diffusing agents. So based on this uh, definition, I believe you also can substitute the mobility term here to easily get the entropy production rate prevalent. Okay, so uh, we already show you, we also, uh, we already successfully to calculate the entropy production rate prevalent for this uh, heat flow and mass transport or people call it diffusion flow process in kinetics, right? So, but, but all this case only limited to only uh, suffer or sub subjected to one driving force. Don't forget, so far only one, right? Okay, so let's back to this uh, slide. This slide actually, we already finished uh, this two, which means we already show you that the, uh, the relationship between the material properties and its own direct coefficient. And there are uh, two uh, uh, important material properties which is we call the seabed coefficient and particular coefficient. And these two material properties would be uh, related with the coupling coefficient. But some people probably will ask what kind or what type of coupling coefficient um, they are involved. So in order to answer these questions, so probably we need to uh, take a look on the definition for the seabed and particular coefficient. So based on this, what's the seabed coefficient? When you apply a, a unit temperature gradient or temperature difference, then how much or how much uh, voltage difference you are going to create it on your materials? So this will, will be the seabed coefficient. So based on this uh, um, definition, we know that we are going to provide the temperature difference, right, alone or at, at two ends of this material. We are going to provide the temperature difference. Then that will result a voltage difference. Oh, that will generate the voltage difference. So, uh, so in this idea, you know, that's definitely a relationship between what? The driving force will be the temperature gradient, the thermal 
driving force, right? Is a, a thermal difference, thermal driving force, and that is correlated or contribute with on the current, right? Current density. Why? Because as long as you uh generate the voltage difference, then you use the conducting wire to make a circuit, circuit, electrical circuit, then that will then you have a voltage difference of vert uh the potential electrical potential gradient so that will result the uh, current electrical current passing through right so based on this you know this feedback coefficient will be highly related with the driving force will be the temperature gradient and contribute on electrical circuit so this feedback coefficient definitely related with the coupling coefficient would be L small q capital Q, right? Driving force will be F capital Q and contribute on J small q. And what's the particular coefficient? It will be the complementary effect of the feedback coefficient. In this particular coefficient, in this case, we provide the electrical current and let's going to generate something different would be this device is going to absorb or release some heat from surroundings so that would be the relationship between what definitely had also is the is uh, the relationship between the heat or the um, the temperature gradient or, or thermal difference with the electrical current, right? Because we supply or apply the electrical current, and they they will result the heat or the salt, some heat or release some heat, uh, to surroundings, right? Okay, so uh, this is just a briefly description about this uh material properties. So I'm going to explain more slides to introduce the feedback effect and explain what's the feedback coefficient and also the what's the particular effect and a uh, particular coefficient and also layer applica ap applications. So first of all, we are going to introduce you what's the feedback effect. Actually, uh, uh, Thomas John Seebeck discovered uh, the, this Seebeck effect in 1822, so it will be around 200 years ago. What he found, actually, he wound the copper, metal copper, and the bismuth together by on these two junctions. They wire these two metals together and put a magnetic needles or compass inside he, this device. And when he, when he, when he heat up one junction and maintain the temperature difference between two, these two junctions, and he found a very interesting stuff. He found that uh, this compass needle was deflected And in the beginning, he think that is that the relationship or interactions between the thermal, because we provide the thermal uh, difference, right? The temperature gradient, right? Or temperature difference, right? Is that the interaction between the thermal effect and magnetic effect? Because the needles, be de de uh, needles, the needle is deflected. Is that the interaction somehow some? interaction between the thermal and magnetic effect but after a serious experiments he found out the magnitude of these diffractions varied with the type of conducting materials you choose and also the temperature difference between these two junctions but it does not depend on the temperature distribution along these conductors. Uh, I, I will. I hope you can highlight uh, this sentence. This is nothing. The magnitude of diffraction is nothing related with the temperature gradient 
or temperature distribution along these conductors. It only be affected by what type or what kind of metal materials you are going to choose, and also the temperature difference you created or apply on these junctions. So he makes some conclusions that he provides the temperature difference or thermal difference, and that probably generate a current. And this current would generate a magnetic field to allow these needles be diffracted. So this is what we call the Seebeck effect. Based on these descriptions, we know the Seebeck effect actually is also can be called as the thermal electrical effect because the thermal difference generate the electrical current. So some people also call this effect as a thermal electrical effect. And based on this description, you also can understand this actual this effect is uh is a relationship describe or explain the relationship between the thermal driving force, the temperature difference or temperature gradient or temperature difference versus the electrical current. So this uh, coefficient definitely has some relationship between a uh, relationship with the coupling coefficient and the small q capital Q because this coupling coefficient means we apply the F tag capital Q is a temperature difference, then they generate the electrical current, right? Is a so it's the definition for L small Q capital Q. Okay. And next, some people probably will question about uh, are there any coefficient or any um, um any terms can describe um this effect, which means when I apply the same temperature difference on apply on these junctions, I believe um uh, we believe the generated electrical currents will be different. So we use the Seebeck coefficient this term to describe uh this effect. So the Seebeck coefficient define as the temperature difference be applied on these junctions and how much electrical potential be created or generated along this on, uh, on this materials. So we define this as a Seebeck coefficient. So as you expected, when I apply the same temperature difference on these materials, the more electrical potential uh, or the large electrical potential be created, then you can observe the larger Seebeck coefficient of less materials. So next, probably you, are, uh, you will ask how to measure uh, the Seebeck coefficient of your interesting material in experiments. So I grabbed two figures here from the internet and try to explain how we measure the Seebeck coefficient. So here, we, you can either put your bug samples or your films on the, on the uh, platform. Then you need to have, uh, you need to create the temperature difference, right? So in this case, uh, there's two blocks, metal blocks, and will be heated up by the heater one and heater two to create the temperature difference. And for this case, you can just uh, use the heater and the cooler beneath your thin film to generate the temperature difference uh, be applied on your materials. Then we use the uh, voltmeter to measure how much electrical potential be created by this temperature difference. So this is how we get, get or measure the Seebeck coefficient. And this some uh, supplementary data I want to know, want, uh, want to let you know. Oh, some people probably already know a, a classification. Oh, there's a term we call the thermoelectrical materials, which 
which means actually is a thermoelectrical effect is a thermoelectrical materials and this uh, groups of material have some uh, spatial characteristic and we also use the value of z to describe whether these materials can are uh, belongs belong to thermoelectrical material and in these materials actually they have some char uh, characteristic for example like they they have they need to have highest seabed coefficient highest electrical conductivity but lower thermal conductivity and this type of elect uh, thermoelectrical materials uh, have less spatial characteristic because why they need to have ele higher uh, electrical conductivity. I believe you know why they have they need to have higher seabed coefficient, right? Because when we apply the temper the same temperature difference on these materials, we hope this type of material can generate more current or more electrical potential difference then that will result more electrical current right so in this case you need to have you need to generate a more current so you need to have a higher electrical conductivity and in order to in order to because you you are going to apply the a temperature difference so you need to this material need to have a poor thermal conductivity otherwise the temperature difference is not easy to to be maintained okay so this uh, groups of materials will use a zt z times this z times the absolute temperature or some people use z to evaluate whether uh, this material is suitable to be a thermal electrical materials so next question will be uh, professor uh, thermoelectrical materials what's the application why for this thermoelectrical materials why this is so important why some people want to have a, a, a this type of material with high z or high z t so i'm going to introduce two uh, important applications for thermoelectrical materials the first one will be the we call the power generation and the second one I'm go, will be the thermocouple you usually use to measure the temperature so let's move to the, the first one application is a we call a power generation so the it called power generation that means you can generate what the current right so how this material generate the current Based on previous con the concept I just introduced to you, you know that uh, as long as I I uh, use the thermoelectrical materials and then I uh, I apply the temperature difference at the two end of these materials. So as long as this is a good electrical uh, thermoelectrical materials, so that will generate what ele the, uh, electrical potential gradient right and which will lead the electrical current right so when i put two thermal electrical material and connect connect them with the electrical circuit then you, you will observe a current be created or generated within this device so this device which can generate the electrical current we call this type of device as a power generation so some people probably will um, have some concern about how to assemble this material thermal electrical material to, together to uh, prepare this kind of device for power generation so i will say if uh if we use the p-type material thermoelectrical material okay so let's move i i forgot to mention one thing is um based on this z you know thermoelectrical materials uh, usually cannot be metal because metal also have a good very good thermal conductivity and cannot be an insulator 
because your insulator have poor electrical conductivity. So in most of case, semi uh P type or N type semiconductor materials usually is good f- is one um either a P type or N type semiconductor materials can be considered a thermal electrical materials. So based on this, we use the P type and N type as an example. So now we apply a temperature difference on this P type uh, materials. And as you know, this this temperature difference uh, will drive the carrier in P type, drive the carrier toward, uh, f- uh, moved from hot side to toward to cold side. And this is a holes be moved from hot side to toward to cold side, right? So you are going to have um which you are going to have a current go this way, right? Okay. So then for the N type, also there's a hot side. So the hot side always drive the carrier from the hot side to toward to cold side. But the carrier in the N type material is the uh, electrons. So the current be created will be the upside direction of the electrons flow. So based on this, and you also use the electrical circuit with the uh, resistance to to make them a uh, electrical circuit. So you are going to generate the electrical current like this, right? So this is we call this um, device we call is a power generation. Uh, I, I'm not I'm not sure whether you have questions like uh, professor, uh, is ne- ne- is it necessary to have a P type and N type to make a device? How about if this is P type? So I'm going to use if you change this um sorry I I if you change you change this to P and also the hot side will drive the elect the holes toward to this side right so you are going to generate the current here but and this one. So you are not going to have a electrical circuit be generated into this circuit, right? Because they 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 have none. They don't have the same directions. They have upside directions. So the uh the electrical circuit generate in this device will be minimized. Will be the minimum, right? So for a for applications, for practical applications, usually to assemble the highest or maximum uh, efficiency of power generation by using these thermal electrical materials, usually we will have the P-type and N-type as a pair to generate the electrical circuit. Okay. Okay, so let's move to... So this is the first... Um, this is the uh, first applications, and the second applications would be this. Can you guys know what is it? It is a. Uh, you can commonly see observe uh, see this device in your oven, a vacuum chamber, even a hot plate. This is what we call the thermocouple, which you, you always use this to measure the temperature. So I also grab the uh the cartoon for simply uh highlight how this uh, thermocouple works and what's the structure or electrical design for this thermocouple. So in most of cases actually uh, you wire the a, material A and material B together by these junctions. You wire he, A and B here to make to have a junction here, and connect this A B materials to a potential meter through location one and two. And we are going to use this junction to measure the uh, our sample to want to test or want to understand to measure the temperature. So this would be a junction. You use this junction like this way 
to measure the uh, temperature which we are interested in. Okay, I'm not sure whether you uh, you have used a thermocouple in your experiments or not. And do you know, let's actually there are different types of thermocouple in your labs. And how to choose what type of thermocouples you are going to use for your uh, experiments. And some people first will, will ask, what's the difference between two different types of thermocouple? The difference actually is based on the uh the combine the what type uh, what kind of materials you are going to choose that will make different types of um thermocouples. And each different types of thermocouple can be used to different uh regions of temperature. For example, like the K type, you can use this type of uh, thermocouple to measure from the minus two hundred up to one thousand two hundred. And if the type for like the thermocouple is type J, it made of iron and a couple nickel alloy, and you can use this to measure the temperature from zero to seven hundred sixteen degrees C. So let's tell you the the different types of uh, thermocouple can be used to uh, measure different uh, temperature re ranges for your experiments. So how to pick up them? That would be that definitely depends on uh, the temperature you are interested in is located to which region, right? And based on this, uh, this is also uh, how this uh, thermocouple works. From previous slide, I just uh, described the actually we use the A material and B material together and measure the uh, the temperature, right? And as you know, actually you connect this A B to work to to the potential meter, which imply already tell you that actually the exactly, um. Uh, parameter you measure is the electrical potential, right? Generated due to this temperature difference. So actually, we can measure the electrical uh, voltage. So finally, actually, we are going to get a curve re between relationship between the electrical voltage versus the temperature. So this is a figure tell you that the vertical axis is the voltage you measured and the horizontal will be the temperature. You really, uh, this is the voltage you measure and this is the uh, temperature region, the temperature you may really measured on your, uh, by that uh, junctions. So based on this, you know, different types of thermocouple has its own uh, curves or slope between the voltage and the temperature. So this imply so this is also tell you that what? Different combination of A material and B material that will the the voltage you can measure will be different. For example, like we take the, the six hundred degree C as an example. Actually the the six hundred degree C we we at least uh under this condition, the delta T actually are the same. It's, it's the same, right? Are the same. But by using different uh, types of uh, thermocouple, or, the, you, or you can say that different combination of A and B, different combination of A and B materials, you are going to get different voltage. You are going to measure the different voltage. Okay? So, so that's back to here. So the most important part here is we measure the voltage and and this voltage voltage is going to relate it with the temperature difference right okay and we are going to do is we want to link the voltage which we measure by this device correlated with the temperature difference and also we hope this can 
and this definitely correlated with the material A and B you used, because the voltage different under the same temperature difference, and by using different combination of A and B, then we we are going to get the different. We are going to measure the different voltage, right? So in this. Uh, in the following devi series of deviation, just want to show you how, how what's the relationship be between the uh the combination of A and B versus the temperature uh, the voltage we measure here. Okay, that means how this materials how this uh, A and B material affect the voltage I measured here. So in order to so. Based on this de description, you know the most important thing is I'm going to obtain the potential measure by this poten potential meter, right? So we are going to obtain the potential at terminal one and two in our experiments. So in order to know the potential measure by terminal one and two, so first of all, I'm going to integral the voltage from junction side toward to one on in A materials. Then next I'm going to integral the voltage from the junction side toward to terminal two in material two or material B. As long as I got this two, then I will get the phi one minus phi j, right? You integral this to this. So you got phi one minus phi j. J means a junction. And this you integral this from from here here to this, so you are going to get the phi two minus phi j. So as long as I know this, so I use this results to minus this results, so I will get I will, I'm going to get the phi a b of phi one two right, will put equals to phi one minus phi two, and this will be the voltage measured by potential meter. Okay, so next question will be how to solve this one. As we mentioned, there's a relationship between the voltage difference, voltage and the temperature difference, right? So, and also, in, so I'm going to show you what's the relationship here. So we start from the flux force equation. In this case, actually, this materials A and B suffer two driving force. The first one will be, probably will be make a circuit, so will be the electrical potential gradient and we you also observe possible important possible temperature difference involved so i can write down the current density direct driven by the electrical potential gradient and indirect couple coupling driven by the f capital q which is a minus temperature gradient divided by t so I substitute this driving force uh, with this term and minus this term in green. Then, as you know, as long as you connect this AB toward to the potential meter, the internal resistance of this potential meter is very large. So the current density will be equals to zero. So this equation equals to zero. Then you are going to move this this turn to a right-handed side and you delete the dt together so you are going to find the relationship between the d phi and dt expressed like this that's right so based so based on this you can move the dt to a right-handed side and take the integral on both sides and regarding to the d phi the integral can be from j to one, and the temperature dt, the temperature would be from t plus delta t toward to t, so it can be like this, right? Because uh, the left hand is I here and right hand is I move a dt here, take an integral, so you got this list would be the same, right? Okay. Then we take the integral on dt over t, so we got the long, so we got this results. And we also assume long 1 plus this term. If x is very small, we can use the x to substitute the long 1 plus x. So we substitute this term with x, which is the delta t divided by t, 1 plus x. Let's use the x 
we assume delta t divided by t is very small. But in some case, if uh, the delta t is very large, then you cannot do this approximation approach. Okay, and uh, the one thing I want to ident uh, emphasize is you need to highlight this term is this term actually is the what is a coupling coefficient and direct coefficient related to a material's property. Every material has its own direct and coupling coefficient, right? So in this case, we integral the voltage on material A. So this term should be belong to A. So you need to highlight this. It belongs to A. Okay. So the same idea can be performed to the in B. So you will get the similar results. And also, I want to highlight here this term. Every material has its own coefficients, so you need to highlight this term actually belongs to B. So next, I'm going to use this term to minus this term. So use this term to minus this term, and the, you take the temperature uh, difference divided by T out, and the, you have this term minus this term. And this is the material properties between, belongs to material A, and this is a material property belongs to material B. If you don't highlight this A and B, then you probably will say, oh, this minus this becomes to zero. So they are not going to have a voltage. No, no. This definitely belongs to every material have its own coefficient. Don't forget this. Okay. So what's the Seebeck coefficient? SAB belong to as I mentioned, we provide a temperature difference delta T and how much poten electrical potential we generate will be phi AB. So we substitute this phi AB with this term divided by temperature difference and delete this term, right? So what you left is, is this term. And SAB, what's SAB means is a CPAC coefficient A respect to B. So belong to SA minus SB. So let's tell you this term is SA and this term is SB. So now you know what is Seebeck coefficient. Seebeck coefficient can be write down as what is the coupling coefficient divided by T and L small q small q. Or you can express like coupling coefficient equals to T Seebeck coefficient times the L small q small q. This is low electrical conductivity. So the coupling coefficient, which we learn, is the interaction between the heat, a thermal driving force contribute on electrical current equals to low ST. Okay, and this serious deviation also tell you what that tell you the voltage you measure, a uh, measure by the potential meter is proportion to the temperature difference and also highly related with what type or what kind of material A and B you choose. So based on uh, so the previous supplementary, even, yes, now I provide the same temperature difference, but what uh, different uh, materials or combination of materials A and B I choose will result in the different voltage. The re actually, both these, these results are consistent, right? Consistent with um, uh, what we derive from this slide. Okay? Next, we finish the Seebeck coefficient and also tell you that the Seebeck coefficient equals to coupling coefficient divided by low T. And in order to measure uh, accurately the Seebeck coefficient, you need to connect to the voltmeter, which is the under the open circuit conditions. So then we can uh, measure the accurate uh, Seebeck coefficient.